Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel. Uh, today, we'll be speaking about open source firmware. Um, first, a small introduction, uh, starting with me, because not everybody necessarily knows me. And I'm, you know, strolling around everywhere. So, yeah, this is me. I'm Daniel. Um, I'm actually a web developer. So people might ask themselves, why am I here at OpenSUSE conference? Because we're talking about operating systems. We're talking about software at large. Um, our platform is a distribution mostly. So, and I'm not even going to talk about web stuff anyway. Um, I also have a security background, in fact. Okay, so I look at all the things out there. I don't just look at the very high level where I'm necessarily working, but also look at very, very low levels sometimes. And that's what brought me here. I'm also a member of a hackerspace in Bochum, Das Labor. Um, that I down there, that's uh, our logo. And I like turtles. Uh, but first, I want to thank you. And by you, I mean especially OpenSUSE, the project, and the community. You all know this friend here on the left. If you don't know the one on the right, this is Oscar. And Oscar is the mascot of the Open Source Firmware Conference. Last year, we had the very first ever Open Source Firmware Conference not far away from here, actually, in Erlangen. And among some large sponsors, we had like ARM and Intel was there. We also had OpenSUSE. And that was a very, very nice surprise for me. I didn't really expect this. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Um, we had 200 participants from all over the world, from many different ages, from different vendors, companies. We had students, we had hobbyists, literally everyone. And also people from different backgrounds. Okay, so not just people working directly on firmware, but we also had people who are even closer to hardware, people who are more in the field of security. And that's why we had two full days of talks and two tracks even. One of them covering the entire security topic. And if you've been following the news a bit, uh, you might see that suddenly we need to look a bit more at security also in the fields of firmware. But more on that later. Um, in addition, we also had two days full of workshops. So we also had a lot of sharing going on. Okay, and that's what we want to spike now. Because, I mean, we all know about open source, um, but we feel like there should also be more in the field of firmware development. So, speaking about which, what is firmware anyway? Okay, so firmware is literally everywhere. Uh, the picture here on the left, I took that from uh, one of the printers in our office once. Uh, because it was just updating its firmware. You know, it, it happens sometimes. So you need to tell people, oh, you can't print right now. It's running a firmware update. And now people suddenly get aware of, well, things actually running on those devices. You know, almost everyone has a watch now like this, or not necessarily everyone, but many people, which is also running some sort of firmware. So those are those very small devices where you usually have one system on chip, and, well, they are kind of ubiquitous now. Um, on the other hand, we all know laptops, like this one here. Uh, th this here is a, um, an actual photograph of another laptop of mine. And here we actually see the settings we can do in the firmware. And in laptops, we typically have more than just one chip. We have lots of chips, and they all need some sort of firmware. So you all know BIOS, the legacy basic input-output system. You heard about UEFI. So that's what many modern platforms are now running. 
that's what's on the host CPU, uh, but you also have the ME, the Intel Management Engine, which is a tiny coprocessor, also somewhere on your main board, found among Intel devices mostly, of course. Um, then you have a gigabit Ethernet interface. It also requires additional firmware in many cases. So that means without that firmware, things may not even function properly. There is an embedded controller somewhere on your laptop, which is nowadays responsible, for example, to power the fan. So it will measure and check the temperature. If it's running too hot, then it will turn on the fan, make it go faster. And if that doesn't work, then, well, your laptop won't survive too long. Which brings us to vendors. So vendors are already providing us with firmware, right? So when we buy a laptop, we know there is already something on there. Even if there is no operating system installed, we still have firmware. So we can boot one of our systems, install it, and happily run our system, right? And we can even upgrade it. So now we have a new project. It's quite some years old now, but you know, still getting more and more traction, the Linux vendors, uh, firmware service, where vendors can go and upload their firmware so that people running you know, all those diverse distros, we have so many of them, people can still, regardless of the distro, use one single tool to upgrade the firmware. There is more than 100 vendors now on the list on that platform. Um, not all of them are already supplying updates there, but the platform is growing and it's more and more vendors doing something. So we're actually done, right? So we, we, we don't really need to do much more in the fields of firmware. Uh, let's check, because there is actually some issues now. Okay, so the first thing is continuous updates. I don't know about you, but usually when I, as an end user, I buy one laptop and I check the vendor's site for updates, usually I can count to like two or maybe three updates through the entire lifetime of the device, which is not very much. We already had a very similar issue with phones. You remember those devices which have been running an ancient version of Android for I don't know how many years? Which is not just a problem for consumers in the end, but also for the entire ecosystem. In my company, we have also developers on mobile platforms. You know, there is iOS developers, which are always happy because Apple is always shipping updates. And there is Android developers who still always have to check, oh, do we still have to support this and this version? how many people are still using it. And we don't want to keep this problem everywhere. So since we currently depend on the vendors, we need to do something ourselves maybe. And we don't just rely on the vendors themselves, but we also rely on the quality. I just had a chat outside with someone telling me that they bought a device, an NVMe drive, and it had a firmware issue for about nine months until they got an update. So imagine you buy a device and you can't use it for an entire year because your vendor doesn't provide you a firmware that actually works for it. And since we have so many components now, there is so much more we need to check for everything to work together. Okay. Um, y you can see uh, one link here. Uh, I, I will publish the slides later so you can follow all those links. I promise you there is many more things to look into so you can follow them later. Okay. Let's look a bit closer at vendors. Supply chains. Um, you're this person down there on the right 
that's the end customer who is now buying some device. You know, we have this big cloud above us, which is promising us, hey, you can use a lot of free and Libre and open source software. You can just download it, you can share it, you can look at it, you can edit it, you can redistribute it, you can do many things with it. Um, but that's only on the operating system currently and applications. You still need to buy some hardware from a retailer. You might be a bit unlucky. You know, sometimes you buy something and, well, you, you will just see, oh, that, that thing doesn't really work for me. You don't expect something. Like when the first problems arose when devices had UFI checking for certain proprietary operating systems to be present you wanted to install another operating system and suddenly people were writing, oh no, nothing works anymore. We have lost our freedom. But that's only where you enter the supply chain. So if you look at this picture, I marked everything in colors, which is a potential issue. Okay, so behind your retailer from which you buy the hardware, there is an OEM even behind, or maybe other OEMs. There can be a whole chain of OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, which, again, talk to other suppliers. There is the so-called ODMs, the device manufacturers or design manufacturers. There is the IBVs, the independent BIOS vendors. Independence means that you know the chain is getting longer and longer. And eventually, we have the SOC vendors, which are actually creating the chips. And now we have to assemble everything together and hope it works out. Which brings us to politics. So we, we as consumers, of course, the only thing we can do is we can choose the devices we want to buy. That's literally the only option we currently have. When I look at hackerspaces, usually there's like, let's say 50 or 60% of people are running some old Lenovo ThinkPads. For some reason, it just, it just developed like this. So they're very well known for a lot of support. So by support, I mean, you can run lots of free software on it, even on some lower level, uh, layers. And that includes even some f uh, firmware. And more on that later. Now the problem is there's still lots of blobs in there. So blobs or binary large objects, that's what we cannot audit. That's the proprietary stuff we get where we lack visibility. If we even want to gain more freedom here, we need to have documentation. And we don't get that documentation everywhere. So only very, very few vendors actually publish their stuff. Which means sometimes you have to have a lot of understanding to actually even get started. We don't even have board schematics in many cases. So what we need to do is we need to disassemble our devices. We need to look at the board itself to get an understanding of how things work or try to come up with conclusions from what we already know from before. But again, it's still lack of knowledge we start with. And then again, there is so many chips which are requiring firmware. And I just mentioned some very briefly. But it's also other components like video, for example. You cannot even have video output without blobs on some platforms. And that's a bad thing for us as an open source community. We don't really want that. We would like to have the sources. We would like to also work on things, improve them. Now, what current vendors do is they implement an interface called UEFI. It's promising to be extensible. It's a firmware interface. That's literally what it means. And it's already huge. Now imagine a huge specification and you even want to extend that. 
that's so complex, this is not where we want to start. And then, of course, there is security. I guess everyone has seen those pictures at some point. Spectre and Meltdown, they were in the news, they were big. There were those raw hammer attacks. And this is mostly still in research now. So it's even hard to tell if people actually exploited those vulnerabilities. So once again, that's another reason why we need more open source firmware. And also board schematics and everything else. The Intel management engines had a longer list of CVEs with one, then the second one, and three, and four, and five coming up. People were getting a bit nervous about it, suddenly calming down again, but still, in the first place, it sounded like, oh no, everything is broken now. Well, I can calm you down again as well. It's not as bad as it sounds, for end consumers at least. Some server boards were having trouble with this, of course because this is where the management engine was actually active. It can be used for provisioning, and that should, of course, work. So, x86. Everything which has a minus is a very, very low layer. This is where we have a platform which we are running on again. And the very first thing here is the ME, the management engine. We rely on something which no one on the outside world has actually seen ever. We could only do some black box tests, so we can look from the outside and at some point say, oh, well, uh, there's some service running here and there, and we can try fuzzing it, and that's how they found the issues with it. And then we build firmware on top of that. There is now the system management mode. Based on that, we can run hypervisors. And then finally, and this is where we are more familiar with everything, we have our kernel. It can be a Linux kernel, it can be a BSD kernel, of course something which is open source, which we know works, and we know how it works, because we have a lot of knowledge about it. We have sharing of documentation, so that's exactly the opposite of what proprietary vendors are doing. And this is what we want, and we want to keep it that way. And of course, that's also true for the applications we run on top, right? So I guess everyone here knows lots of open source applications, they know how to use them, and maybe even saw some of the source code, or even delivered patches at some point. By the way, I made this uh, presentation here with Pandoc, although it's the same design as everyone else is using. Um, I made it work also with Pandoc, so they got some patches now. So that's one upside of this talk here. But that, that's also what we want, right? So being able to contribute, knowing what's going on, auditing things, giving back. And that's why finally we want open source firmware. There is one project called U-Boot. Um, you might have heard about it because it's quite famous now. They support multiple different architectures, more than a thousand boards and you find them on lots of small devices. That includes uh, lots of routers you can get for home use. And also stuff like this. This thing here is so tiny, it's literally just a gigabit ethernet port and a small MIPS CPU behind it. And it's probably booting with U-Boot. I'm still investigating this, but this is uh, kind of the devices we're talking about when we talk about U-Boot mostly. It's also been used on other platforms, of course. Yeah. And what does U-Boot do? It initializes your hardware. So eventually, 
including this device and also your home routers, we probably run a Linux kernel on top. In this case here, it's a build of OpenWRT, the famous open source router project, which is also used for the uh, German Freifunk project, or not just German, I guess now it's also spread among other countries. And it's so amazing, we can literally build an entire machine now because we have the overview of all the code running on it, except for maybe some blobs still missing there. Okay, um, U-Boot can run a Linux kernel directly, but it can also run other stuff. For example, it could run a UEFI payload or a legacy BIOS payload. Okay. And another project here is Core Boot. It's very similar in the regard that it actually supports also lots of different devices and platforms. So it supports x86, supports also some ARM devices and others. And it can also boot a Linux kernel directly. And since we are here using a Linux-based software distribution, I guess you can see where this is going. It's used uh, by Google for the Chromebooks, which are also based on the Linux kernel. It's being applied to more and more servers now. It's also getting popular among some hackers. So I mentioned I'm in a hacker space, and in fact in Bochum we kind of have like 10 people now toying around with this. So now I just told you we can run a Linux kernel straight from the firmware. What does that mean? You're used to seeing a bootloader, right? So usually when you turn on your laptop, you see something like Grub or Lilo back in the days. There's some others. And what are they doing? They are re-implementing a lot of stuff which we already have in the Linux kernel. Like drivers for hard disks, USB, and so on. Networking for Pixie Boot, maybe. You can even decrypt your hard drives. But why? And that's why we now have the Linux Boot project. It started last year in January. That's when it was announced. And the idea of Linux Boot is to use a very small Linux kernel, very similar to the OpenWRT project, just use its drivers for devices, for uh, file systems, for maybe networking, for Pixie Boot again, and then rely on the fact that Linux has been used and developed by so many people that we can be very certain that it works properly. Okay? And now the quest is, we can suddenly implement bootloaders, which really don't have to do much more now. We really just need to boot an operating system. Imagine you already have drivers, so you can look at file systems, can read files, now you can kxec into your next Linux kernel. It's amazing. So this is a project which is now continuing and growing. Um, it's written in Golang, or some utilities are actually written in Golang. Um, so if you, if you are familiar with that language, it's something you could look into. But since we are running a Linux kernel now, you can write in any of the languages you are familiar with, which you can run on an operating system, right? So you can write something in Rust, you can write something in C if you will, anything. Now you can help yourself in case you can boot. And if you are eager now to 
try this out. I want to tell you a bit about the equipment you need first. So we need to take things apart, right? We need screwdrivers. You, you can get those everywhere. You probably already have them at home. Maybe you already exchanged some RAM or, or added some more or added a hard drive or something. So this is what you already know. And in some cases, you literally have to open the entire laptop to actually get to where you need to work, right? Uh, I promise you a very good investment is a magnifying lens. That's because, uh, for some reason, those chips were made in such a way that they print dark gray on almost black, so it's very hard to read. And, you know, if you have a Mac and you have some extra light and you turn it a bit, then sometimes it really helps a lot to find the right chips in the right place. So this is how you can identify your chips. You see those chips here. Uh, this one. This is actually a very small flash chip from which the firmware image is read. So on this board here, we have two of them. On one of them, we have this test clip. And this saves you the pain of actually doing soldering work. So you can just attach the clip. You just need to figure out the orientation. And that's all. And suddenly you can interact with this chip. It's very much like a USB drive, just a bit smaller. So usually those range from 4 to 8 to 16 megabytes these days. This is the 8-pin form factor. There is also 16-pin form factors. Uh, but this is what you mostly find on current mainboards, like this one, for example. On the other side, you need a programmer. You can use anything which knows SPI. This one here is a very, very cheap device. You can get it for five or six or seven euros on Amazon or eBay or whichever is your preferred platform. Um, you can also use a BeagleBone Black or Raspberry Pi. People are famously doing this a lot. So if you look at tutorials, for example, for Core Boot, uh, people sometimes use those. Uh, I prefer this tiny device for uh, one reason. I don't need to find the SPI interface and I don't get the wires wrong so easily. Right? So I only need to get the orientation right and that's literally it. And again, it's quite cheap. And of course, we need the software side. So we have open source firmware now. Uh, we need to build it. If you know how to build a Linux kernel, then you also know how to build core boot or U-boot. The process is always the same. You need a tool chain. You need a tool chain on your host. But you also need a tool chain for your actual target. So for example, core boot lets you just build a tool chain with a very small make command. And then you can just choose it for your desired target platform. Of course, it takes a while, but you know, then you have a tool chain. Sometimes you need some extra utilities. For example, one that is called YASL or IASL, which is used for some other code to be converted. And then some utility to use the programmer. There is the Flash Run project, which is also adopted now by the Core Boot community which knows how to use lots of SPI programmers, including the one I showed. But it also supports others like Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone Black. You can use many different ones. Now we have everything. Let's start hacking. So this is the first very simple thing which you can do even without the hardware equipment. Everybody can literally do this. You can clone a project, let's say the Core Boot project. You can build its toolchain. By default, it's configured to be running with CBIOS, a legacy BIOS implementation, which is open source. 
And then you can just run it in QEMU just to try it out and see if it boots. So here's just a screenshot from CBIOS, which is coming right after Coreboot. So Coreboot takes it as a payload and then just runs it. And it gives us some output. Right? It says, hey, I'm CBIOS running here. It's running on the screen. Now we have output here. And it can try to boot something. You can even attach an ISO file. And then you can boot your favorite operating system. But of course, this is more fun. OK, so I want every one of you to look at the devices you find around you. Disassemble them. Look into them. We need that information, which is still proprietary now. We can get lots of clues by just opening up devices. We can read out firmware. We can analyze it. We can look at the board schematics from, well, the extra hardware standpoint, if we don't have them in data sheets. We can try to figure things out. And that's what I did. This year is the result of, let's say, some years of work. I had this laptop for quite a while. It's from XMG, which are related to Tuxedo. They are also present here. Um, and I was having a slight problem with the touchpad here. So uh, this thing here is a gigabyte laptop, so it's not Clevo branded as uh, most of the other devices they sell. And gigabyte doesn't publish much information. I tried to apply one of their firmware updates. I got it to boot. After having all of this knowledge, I literally used the programmer to flash that new firmware. But I wasn't still very happy with it. So a friend of mine said, hey, let's see. Maybe you can get along with Core Boot. And I promise you, it was a very, very refreshing, painful, and at the same time, happy tour through all the layers of hardware and firmware. I gained so much knowledge just during the last, let's say, three months while doing this. All my progress is uh, behind those links here. So I put everything on GitHub. There is one gist where I dropped lines on all the steps I went through. Some patches are already in the core boot documentation now. And there will be more and more added. And at some point, you will see that it's actually so similar to the Linux kernel in lots of ways. We can learn from each other. And in fact, for this very device here, I looked at the Linux kernel source code to find relationships between certain chips I have in this laptop. For, for some reason, I was, I was lucky to figure out about one chip that it's actually the same model as a different one when a company name changed. But, you know, how do you figure this out? Even if you know names of certain chips, you use a search engine to get information. It's really not trivial. But we can share information. And I'm very happy that the Linux kernel is open source, so I could get that. So what did I get to work? Um, you can see text on the screen here. It's not in a high resolution, so that's uh, still something coming up, but you know, I already got this output. Um, of course, before that even, RAM works. If you know operating systems, you already know that RAM is there. But this is what the firmware needs to initialize first. So that's the first step you need to go through until you can actually do something more meaningful. They can initialize all the other hardware. But if you don't have RAM, then, you know, nothing actually works. OK, so the laptop booted. I could also uh, boot in my operating system. I could get the high resolution because the Linux kernel had the correct drivers and everything. And in fact, even without the video blob, I could actually boot. I just couldn't see the prompt where I would have to enter my password here to unlock. But I figured that out later then. 
Bluetooth works, Wi-Fi works, USB works, even suspend and resume, which I didn't expect in the first place, worked. It didn't work with the lid being closed, so there is ACPI events which need to be triggered, but yeah, that, that's the next steps now. And one thing which is even more painful, I already mentioned this earlier, the embedded controller, which is responsibly, uh, responsible for cooling down the system, it didn't really do its job. I haven't yet figured out the issue, but we're getting there. Now here's another call for action. I know we have very, very, very smart people here who can help. We have Tuxedo here. I talked to them. There is other vendors, of course, but please talk to them. Talk to the device manufacturers or the retailers or OEMs, whatever, where you get your laptop from. Talk to them, ask them about open source firmware. That's the first step to signal that we have a lot of interest in that. Operating system distributions. Why not integrate firmware updates as well? We just had a talk, a very short one, but a very good one, about transactions. When you hear, hey, we don't really want you to install firmware updates actually because it might break your device. That doesn't make us very happy. Coreboot supports having multiple payloads and multiple implementations of the initialization as well. So we can also fail over. That's what the Chromebooks are, for example, doing, by the way. We can build our own firmware. We have OBS. We can even run checks on the firmware. We can use OpenQA for that. We have a lot of infrastructure. And of course, we can bring the kernel and firmware developers a bit closer together. So. If you're working on the Linux kernel, look into projects like U-Boot, look at Coreboot. See if there is something you can do for them, see if there is something they can do for you so that you don't need to fix broken ACPI tables or something. You can join the community. We have different channels in different chat systems, IRC, uh, there is Slack for the more modern people. And of course, now, let's celebrate actually. U-Boot and Coreboot are both turning 20 this year. This work has been going on for 20 years. It's not as old as the Linux kernel. And in fact, the core boot project itself was first called Linux BIOS because that's what they were going for. Now it's more universal. We can celebrate 20 years of open source firmware, but there is still so much work to be done. So let me invite you to join us in the Open Source Firmware Conference. The next edition will be this year, again in September. This time we will be in San Francisco, so we're going around the globe a bit. If you are interested, the call for papers is still open. If there is something you can tell, maybe from the perspective of an operating system, from a distribution, or from a kernel, please do so. We had lots of interesting talks already last year, and what I'm still missing is more synergies, because I feel that there is still something we can share. And with that, thanks again for everything, for listening to me here in the afternoon and hot summer. <laughs> and if you have any questions,
please ask me everything. Uh, the mic is already there. So you so said that you were interested in building um, bootloader packages. So we already have a hardware colon boot project in OBS that could be used for that, or you could have, you know, sub project yeah. as. Can needed. you get the mic a bit closer? Sorry. Yeah. There is a hardware colon boot project in OBS. If there's any additional bootloaders that you need beyond U-Boot that we already have there, for instance, you're free to submit stuff there, or we can also create, you know, sub-projects as needed for that. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, my question uh, relates to the uh, management engine, Intel. Uh, there are a couple of myths running around it, and what would happen if I just switch it off? Hmm. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. How? So what you can do literally is, if you have the ME region in that flash chip I showed you, you can just override it with zeros. I promise you, your system won't boot. <laughs> That's what is going to happen. There is one project which is called ME Cleaner to strip down the ME to the essential part you actually need. I mean. If you don't have the ME running, then sadly, your device won't really work. That's the sad news. The good news is that we can at least remove some stuff which is really not necessary, but potentially harmful. The project is also still going on. It's a Python script, so you can look into that. You mentioned Tuxedo twice, um, so can we assume from that that the current devices that they're selling with OpenSUSE pre-installed have a proprietary firmware still? <laughs> this one here is actually also a Tuxedo laptop, and it is running a proprietary firmware. In this case, it's from American Megatrends, you know, or AMI for short. Um, and I even ran an upgrade to that. So currently they do ship proprietary firmware. They do offer updates. You have to sign up on their platform and ask for them, but you can at least get updates. But of course, I would also love to see open source firmware on it. And I actually do talk to them a lot. And we have one guy who already ported his laptop to Coreboot, which is also a Tuxedo one, a quite modern one. And I'm looking forward to porting this year next. So once my other laptop is working properly again, we, we can swap roles and take care of this one. We have two minutes. <laughs> I, s I still have a little bonus. I already talked to you being maybe kernel developers or maybe distro developers. There is an event coming up, the ITSA or ITSA. ITSA is also here in Nuremberg. so. That's later in the year. You can use this opportunity to come and visit a friend of mine who is running the company Nine Elements Cybersecurity. They port Core Boot onto more and more devices and they develop security features for the firmware. So if you are running data centers, this might be an option for you as a business user. Any more questions now? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>